Good afternoon, everyone. So we just concluded the inaugural meeting of the new U.S.-Japan Economic Consultative Committee, otherwise known as the EPCC or EPIC. Um, Secretary Raimondo and I were very glad to welcome our colleagues here to Washington today. Uh, Foreign Minister Hayashi and I saw each other just a few weeks ago in Bali for the G20, um, and then in Tokyo where I had the opportunity to convey the profound sympathy and sorrow of the American people to the people of Japan after the assassination of Prime Minister Abe. Uh, as you may know, uh, the EPCC was a product of President Biden and Prime Minister Kishida's meeting in January, uh, their first major talk after the Prime Minister took office last fall. They agreed that the U.S.-Japan alliance has never been stronger or more necessary and that our country should deepen our cooperation to strengthen the rules-based economic order to address urgent challenges facing our workers, our businesses, people, uh, and accelerate open, inclusive, and sustainable economic growth in the Indo-Pacific and beyond. Today's first meeting of the EPCC was, I think it's fair to say, a resounding success. Productive, substantive, directly connected to issues that matter uh, in our people's lives and in their futures. We discussed building resilient supply chains after the COVID-19 pandemic revealed just how fragile they are. We addressed emerging technologies, which bring so much promise of opportunity, but also risks to national security, human rights, consumer health and safety, intellectual property. We talked about Moscow's war on Ukraine. Our countries are working closely to impose costs on Russia so that President Putin will end the war uh, and address, of course, in the meantime, uh, food and fuel prices worldwide that have been uh, spiked in part because of Russia's aggression. We discussed development finance and the problem of opaque lending practices that can weigh down countries with unsustainable debt. And we addressed the People's Republic of China and how its coercive economic practices go against an open, inclusive, rules-based international economic order that gives all countries a chance to participate, to compete, and to grow. Uh, Japan and the United States believe in a global economy where all countries hold themselves to norms, to standards, to practices that allow people, ideas, goods, capital to move freely, where disputes are resolved swiftly, peacefully, openly, and where trade and commerce support workers, raise incomes, protect the environment, and create opportunity for as many people as possible. The EPCC is the latest addition to an ever-growing partnership with Japan. Uh, a few months ago in Tokyo, our two countries joined 12 others to launch the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework to support a stronger, fairer, more resilient economy across the region. Our countries work together through the Quad with India and Australia on issues from global health to the climate crisis to infrastructure. We cooperate through the OECD to tackle bribery and corruption, through the Global Action Plan to fight COVID-19, through the new Mineral Security Partnership to bolster critical mineral supply chains. And beyond all of these different initiatives uh, and, and fora, the bilateral relationship between Japan and the United States encompasses just about every issue we face, from protecting our national security to defending human rights to advancing our vision for a free and open Indo-Pacific region. Uh, the work that we did today, making clear together that our economic security is a vital component of our overall national security and well-being, I think just underscores the importance and the breadth and depth of our partnership. We are deeply grateful for our alliance uh, with Japan. It stretches back decades, sustained by cherished ties of family and friendship between our peoples. The work we did here today reflects the strength of that partnership but also, importantly, carries it forward. On a separate note, uh, earlier today, I spoke with Russian Foreign Minister Lavrov. We had a frank and direct conversation. I pressed the Kremlin to accept the substantial proposal that we put forth on the release of Paul Whelan and Brittany Griner. I also emphasized that the world expects Russia to fulfill its commitments under the deal it reached with Ukraine, Turkey, and the United Nations on grain shipments from Ukraine. Ambassador Brink, our ambassador to uh, Ukraine, was in Odessa this morning. She confirmed the ships are loaded 
and ready to go, it is important and vital that Russia make good on the commitments it's made, made to the world. Uh, as I made clear, um, we're looking to see that move forward as soon as possible. I also made clear to Foreign Minister Lavrov that in light of recent statements coming from the Kremlin about their plans to proceed with the further annexation of Ukrainian territory, indeed, the Foreign Minister's own words about replacing a uh, democratically elected Ukrainian government as well as being part of their uh, ongoing plans, those plans would never be accepted. The world will not recognize annexations. We will impose additional significant costs on Russia if it moves forward with its plans. We'll also continue to stand with Ukraine, support its ability to defend itself, impose costs on Russia until it ends its aggression. We continue to coordinate closely with allies and partners, including very closely with Japan, to support Ukraine and to hold Moscow to account. And as always, we're prepared to work with Ukraine and others to support any meaningful diplomatic efforts to end the war, to end the aggression. So, with that, let me just thank my colleagues so much for an uh, incredibly productive meeting and for designing together uh, the way ahead uh, and to make sure that um, the EPPC really is an epic achievement between our countries. Thank you. え、今回は外務大臣として初めてのワシントン first a ministerial level economic 2 plus 2 with Secretary Blinken, Secretary Raimondo, and Minister Hagiuda. We had a very fruitful exchange of thoughts. I would like again to thank both secretaries for their wonderful hospitality. The Economic 2 plus 2 is the first attempt in the alliance of Japan and the United States to discuss foreign and security policy and economic policy as a unit. In the background, there is a shared urgency between Japan and the United States that existing international order is challenged not only by unilateral attempt to change the status quo by force, but also by attempt to realize strategic interests by exerting economic influence in unfair and opaque ways. In order to respond to such crisis effectively, today, four ministers from Japan and the United States gathered and discussed a wide variety of issues, including economic policies of respective countries, establishment of a regional economic order, and economic security. This is the response to the requirement of time, and I believe it serves as a strong message about the adaptability of Japan with alliance in a rapidly changing international economy and about the resolve by Japan and the United States to lead the international cooperation in this area. Today we discussed the following points in confirming the cooperation. First, we discussed rules-based free and open international order. As the economy has a strong influence on diplomacy today, Japan and the United States confirmed that we would cooperate with like-minded countries, not only from the economic perspective, but also also, from a strategic perspective, in order to maintain and develop international order to ensure economic security. Regarding energy security and food security, we discussed assistance to those countries that are gravely impacted by the invasion of Ukraine by Russia. Also, I expressed Japan's support on IPEF, and as the United States plays a more active role in the economic order of the Indo-Pacific region, and conveyed my strong hope to both secretaries that the United States come back to TPC. Second, we discussed response to the exertion of international economic influence to hinder, sorry, in, intentional economic influence to hinder some 
solidarity in the international community and to distort foreign policies of different countries and confirmed on a shared awareness. Economic coercion issue was also taken up by G7 Elma Summit, and I hope to deepen the discussion towards the G7 Hiroshima Summit. Also, regarding the unfair and opaque development finance, I hope that Japan and the United States can work together to ensure all countries comply to the international rules and standards. In addition, we agreed that for Japan and the United States to ensure our own competitiveness and resilience, we will continue to promote cooperation based on core partnership that was uh, concurred in April last year. We also agreed to establish stronger supply chain cooperating with like-minded countries. I would like to reiterate that we are not pursuing protectionism or block economy, but any policy will give due consideration to transparency and predictability for businesses. I hope that we can continue to deepen our discussions in various related areas with like-minded countries, taking opportunities of occasions such as G7 chaired by Japan and APEC chaired by the United States, we have agreed to hold the ministerial meeting on a regular basis, and I look forward to our next meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. And thank you to Secretary Blinken for hosting us, uh, bringing us together. And thank you to Ministers Hagayuda and Hayashi for joining us and for being present here in the United States for this very important meeting. I also would like to uh, join with Tony in expressing my condolences to our colleagues and to the people of Japan for the tragic loss of Prime Minister Abe. So I share the assessment with Secretary Blinken that today's meeting was a resounding success. We had candid, productive, open, substantive discussion and I'm very proud of the joint progress on promoting economic growth, addressing threats to the global order, and enhancing security and resilience. The close ties between the United States and Japan support good jobs in both of our countries and contribute to our mutual prosperity and security. Our alliance is an increasingly important force for peace and prosperity, not only in the Indo-Pacific region, but in fact, throughout the world. I also want to acknowledge how deeply grateful I am that Congress yesterday finally approved funding for the CHIPS Act. Uh, as we discussed today, semiconductors are the linchpin of our economic and national security. And we had an excellent discussion today around how Japan and the United States could collaborate, especially with respect to advanced semiconductors. The $52 billion investment in the CHIPS Act in domestic semiconductor production will enable us to create hundreds of thousands of jobs in the United States, rebuild American manufacturing, and strengthen our supply chain for decades to come. Just as important, this funding will strengthen our partnerships with allies like Japan. It will enhance our joint work on supply chains, promote the competitiveness of both of our nations, and importantly, make us less dependent on our adversaries for such a critical piece of technology. It will build on, um, excuse me, just as importantly, uh, the funding will strengthen our partnerships and will build on the meeting that Minister Hagyuda and I had in May where we expressed shared intent for cooperation on semiconductor supply chains. I look forward to the day not too far from now, where here in America we have American-made chips supplying Japanese auto plants here in the United States. Together, our two nations are leading the way in investing in our futures. So again, I just want to thank Minister Hagiuda and Minister Hayashi for joining us. Thank you for your efforts to forge new and stronger bonds between our nations, our communities, and our people.
経済産業大臣の萩生田光一です。私からもご答弁、アメリカ国民の皆様から、First, 安倍元総理へお願いしたアメリカ国民の皆様に対して、本当にありがとうございます。日米同盟こそ、日本外交の基軸である安倍元総理は常々そう語っておりました。オバマ元大統領との歴史的な広島と真珠湾への訪問には、当時、官房副長官として私も同行しましたが、安倍元総理は一貫して日米両国民の絆をさらに強固なものにするため、その政治生命を傾けてきました。この度、バイデン大統領には日本大使館まで弔問にお越しいただきました。ブリンケン国務長官には日本まで足を運んでいただき、レモンド商務長官からは心のこもったメッセージをいただきました。アメリカ国内では政府機関だけではなく、数多くの場所で反旗が掲げられたと聞いております日米両国の国民レベルに及ぶ深い絆を示すものであり、安倍元総理に代わって、深く深く本音を申し上げます。ジャパンイズバック、ここ、ワシントンで安倍元総理が宣言したのは10年ほど前のことです。日本が再び民主主義のチャンピオンたるアメリカと手を携えて、世界の平和と繁栄にリーダーシップを発揮する。その決意表明でしたそして CPTPP、自由で開かれたインド太平洋、クワッド、10年間で地域の平和と繁栄を支えるさまざまな基盤を築き上げてきました。ブリンケン国務長官は先日大きな喪失感を感じていると申し上げました率直に申し上げて日本全体も大きな喪失感に覆われていますしかしながらジャパンイズヒアトゥステイこれからも日本はアメリカと手を携え世界の平和と繁栄のために力を尽くしていくその明確な決意を申し上げるため本日私はこの場所にやってまいりました本日初めて開催された経済版2プラス2はそのための枠組みです。サプライチェーンリスク、経済的威圧、外交、安全保障政策と経済政策はもはや一体過分です。そうした時代に日米の外務、経済の閣僚が膝詰めで議論を行い、一致したメッセージを世界に発信する、その意義は極めて大きいと考えます。デジタルなど新たな課題に対し、ルールに基づく新しい経済秩序を作り上げるアメリカ政府のリーダーシップのもと地域の多くの国々の参加を得て IPEF による新たな経済秩序づくりが進んでいることを表明しますエネルギー安全保障ビジネスと人権情報通信など信頼性の高いインフラの整備蓄電池や重要鉱物などサプライチェーンの強靭化私たちにはやらなければならないことは賛成しております今回共同声明を取りまとめると同時に課題ごとの具体的な行動計画も発出できたのが大きな成果です宇宙、海洋、サイバーなど重要振興技術の分野でも協力を強化し経済安全保障をしっかりと確保するそのことも本日かなりの時間を割いて充実した議論を行いました攻めと守りの両面から取り組んでいく輸出管理による保護と合わせ最先端の技術開発を推進してまいります次世代半導体の日米共同開発を加速することでも私たちは一致をしましたマークには早速行動に移します三層圏、理研、東京大学など次世代半導体研究におけるワークインの英知を結集し新しい研究開発組織を立ち上げることを決定しました海外の企業や研究機関にもオープンであり国際共同研究のハブとする考えです科学技術立国、日本の力を結集して、日米、さらには有志国の協力をリードしていく決意です。外交上の要求を通すために、経済的な力を国際ルールに反するような形で、一方的に行使するようなことはあってはなりません。太平洋からインド洋へと至るこの広大な海と空は自由で誰にでも開かれたものであり国の大小にかかわらず全ての国に恩恵をもたらすものでなければなりませんこの経済版2プラス2はいわば自由で開かれたインド太平洋の実現に向けた羅針盤
この地域に平和と繁栄をもたらす基盤となるものですそのためにこれからもここに並ぶレモンド商務長官ブリンケン国務長官林外務大臣と力を尽くしていくそう決意をしています私からは以上です Thank you very much We'll now turn to questions. We'll alternate two per side. We'll start with Sean Tandon of the AFP. Hi. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon. Uh, Mr. Secretary, could I begin by following up on your remarks about your conversation with Foreign Minister Lavrov? Um, how uh, confident are you about this、uh, raising the chances of bringing home Brittany Griner and Paul Whelan?、Uh, what is the sense that you got from,、uh, from Foreign Minister Lavrov? Um, I know also you mentioned earlier this week that you're not planning to negotiate in Ukraine with the Russians.、Uh, but what was the overall sense that you got from, from Mr. Lavrov? Are you any more confident that the United States could be dealing with Russia and making progress in any area there?、Uh, and do you plan to speak to him again or even meet him?、Uh, as was announced today, you're going to be in Cambodia、uh, next week for, for ASEAN.、Uh, and perhaps if I could open up to.、Um, To everybody here,、uh, a week of、uh, phone calls, I suppose. The, the,、uh, the phone call yesterday that the president had with,、uh, with President Xi of China,、uh, does this,、um, do you feel that this,、uh, this, this makes any progress on the issue of Taiwan? How concerned are you about the, the tensions in Taiwan right now and a potential visit by Speaker Pelosi?、Uh, do you think that,、uh, are you confident that that's、uh, something you can work through, or are you worried that, about that、uh, aggravating the situation? Thank you very much.、Uh, Sean, thank you very much.、Um, First, just to put this in, in perspective,、um, we said all along that、uh, if we thought there was any opportunity to advance、uh, diplomacy to、uh, end Russia's aggression against Ukraine, we would, of course, take it. Unfortunately, tragically, we've seen no、uh, opening, willingness、uh, on the part of Russia to engage meaningfully on ending the aggression. At the same time, I've also said that.、Um, If there are issues where it could make a difference in senior Russians hearing directly from me or from colleagues, we would, of course,、um, pursue that. And with regard to the call with,、uh, with the foreign minister today, as I noted、uh, the other day when we had an opportunity to speak,、um, I told you what I intended to raise with him, and I raised exactly what I said I would raise with him. That is, the significant proposal that's been on. The table some, for some weeks now that would lead to bringing home Paul Whelan and Brittany Griner.、Um, I urged Foreign Minister Lavrov to move forward with that proposal. I'm not going to characterize his response, and I can't give you a, an assessment of whether I think things are any more or less likely, but it was important that、uh, he hear directly from me on that.、Uh, second, as I said the other day,、uh, on behalf of many, many countries around the world, Getting Russia to move on the commitments it's made, not just to、uh, the United Nations,、um, uh, Turkey, and Ukraine in the context of the deal that was agreed, but to the entire world that is looking for an end to the blockade、uh, of the Odessa port by Russia that has denied so many people the food that they need and depend on and has also resulted in a significant increase in food prices、uh, over many months.、Uh, Important that、uh, he hear directly from me on behalf of many other countries the expectation that Russia would move forward with its commitments and would stop end the blockade and allow the ships to sail.、Um, and finally,、uh, you heard me say the other day the deep concern that many countries around the world have in hearing in recent days about Russia's expanded war aims in, in Ukraine, particularly their plans to proceed with the annexation. Of additional Ukrainian territory. And I laid out exactly what we anticipate they will do in the weeks and months ahead, including having、uh, sham referendums in,、uh, in these parts of, of Ukraine,、um, trying to、um, falsely demonstrate that the people in these parts of Ukraine somehow seek to become part of Russia, all to advance President Putin's objectives in、um, gobbling up as much Ukrainian territory as he can,、uh, and from his perspective, Trying to erase、uh, Ukraine as an independent sovereign country. That, of course, is not going to happen. The Ukrainian people have made clear that that's not going to happen.、Uh, and the world has made clear they're not going to let that happen. But short of that,、uh, President Putin is trying to grab as much Ukrainian territory as he can. And it was very important that、uh, the Russians hear directly from us that、um, that will not be accepted. And not only will it not be accepted, it will result in additional significant costs being imposed upon Russia. 
if it follows through uh, on those plans. So I don't want to characterize any of Foreign Minister Lavrov's uh, responses. If you have an opportunity to ask him, please proceed. Um, with regard to um, the, uh, the call between President Biden and, and President Xi, um, first, uh, as you know, this followed uh, previous discussions, uh, including most recently in March, and it also builds on a number of recent engagements, including the uh, time I spent with Foreign Minister Wang Yi in, in Bali, uh, where we spent about uh, five hours together, the National Security Advisor, Jake Sullivan, the Secretary of Defense, the Treasury Secretary, uh, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, have each had recent conversations or engagements with, uh, uh, with their counterparts. Um, and this is part of our effort to make sure uh, that we maintain and deepen lines of communication with China, uh, to responsibly manage the uh, many differences that we have, and to work together wherever it is that our interests align. And that was very much the, the nature of the conversation. I can just say, uh, again, it covered basically three, three things. Um, where our two countries can work together, uh, with a particular focus on climate change, on health security, on counter-narcotics. Um, second, uh, an exchange of views on Russia's aggression in Ukraine. Uh, and finally, uh, Taiwan, where President Biden underscored that our policy has not changed. The United States strongly opposes any unilateral efforts to change the status quo or to uh, undermine peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait. Um, so that was the, uh, the nature and basically the substance of the conversation they had. They touched on uh, a number of other uh, issues. But um, look, I'll just say this in conclusion. Uh, we have many differences when it comes to Taiwan, but over the past 40 plus years, we have managed those differences uh, and done it in a way that has preserved peace and stability uh, and has allowed uh, the people of, uh, on Taiwan to flourish. Uh, it would be important as part of our shared responsibility to continue uh, to manage this in a wise way that doesn't create uh, the prospect for, for conflict. Uh, and keeping open lines of communication on this issue, especially between President Biden and President Xi, I think is vital to, to doing that. We believe direct communication between the leaders is um, the most essential aspect of meeting our responsibilities to manage issues as fraught as Taiwan in the most responsible way possible. Mr. Matsuda from Kyodo. ジャパンとイギリスは一緒に取り組んでいます。In particular, since the United States and Japan are number one and two democratic economies in the world, it would be beneficial for us to discuss strategically about the policies to be implemented in such situations. Economic 2 plus 2 is here to respond to this kind of requirement of this era and to demonstrate that the alliance can adapt to the changes in the international environment. Based on today's economic 2 plus 2 
discussion, the governments of Japan and the United States will promote cooperation in various areas and work to maintain and develop orders in the international community, including in the Pacific region. Also, performing international economic order, not only cooperation between Japan and the United States, but also cooperation with like-minded countries is essential. We hope to share strategic cooperation and issues that we discussed today at Economic Tuplet with the G7 countries in a summit chaired by Japan next year so that we can further expand the cooperation. Also, regarding the relationship with ASEAN, uh, Japan and the United States have always respected the unity and centrality of ASEAN while promoting concrete cooperation towards achievement of free and open Indo-Pacific and ASEAN outlook on Indo-Pacific. We will continue to closely cooperate with regional partners aiming to achieve sustainable and inclusive economic growth in Indo-Pacific and economic security that we discussed today during the Economic Tuplus 2, and also uh, by utilizing the framework such as IPEF by the United States. Um, I agree with everything uh, that my, my colleague has said. Um, I would simply add a couple of points or reinforce a couple of points. First, uh, the United States and Japan share a conviction that economic security and national security are inseparable. They are fundamentally linked. And I think it was very important to both of us uh, and our, all of our colleagues to further elevate the discussions we're having on uh, economic security issues uh, because they're really front and center on, the, on, on our agenda and on the world's agenda. Uh, and the very the issues that you heard us talk about uh, today uh, I think really go to, in many ways, very practical things that our people in Japan, in the United States, and beyond are uh, feeling, experiencing in their, um, in their lives. And we have a, a shared conviction that uh, working together, we can um, make a genuine difference in advancing uh, opportunity uh, and dealing with challenges to the well-being of our people in the, uh, in the economic sphere. So that's the most important thing. Um, second, I would simply say that many of the initiatives that we're engaged in together, whether it's between the United States and Japan, whether it's in the context of, of, of ASEAN, uh, IPEF, the Quad, these are mutually reinforcing. Um, and they, in effect, add strength to each other. Uh, and I think uh, we, we saw that today because many of the things that we talked about um, overlap with uh, issues that are on the agenda of uh, IPEF, the Quad, et cetera. When the United States and Japan can uh, work together to help drive some of these issues, and next year, as you know, Japan will be in the, uh, the lead of the G7, we will uh, be in the lead of uh, APEC, um, we can make a big, big difference in actually moving forward. Last thing is this. Um, we get to uh, stand up here and share with all of you the results of our, our meeting. The, the truth of the matter is there are a number of people who are sitting with us today and others who are back in their ministries in Tokyo uh, and uh, here in, in Washington who really drive the work every single day. So we've agreed that we will um, meet again among the four of us next year, but in between then, uh, we laid out a very detailed and concrete agenda for our teams to follow up on between now and the end of the year and then into next year. So that not only have we set out a basic vision together and framework for the work that our countries can do, uh, we'll actually follow up with concrete initiatives to make all of this real. So I think that's the other importance of today, uh, an agreement that we're really going to drive this forward together over the next months. Joel Berkey, Washington Examiner. Hi, thank you for doing this. Um, Mr. Foreign Minister, I wonder, are, are, starting on Taiwan, uh, is the Japanese government uh, making any contingency planning from a security perspective for a potential crisis in the near term, whether that would be prompted by a, a visit from Speaker Pelosi or some other visit? Uh, and does the, um, does the Japanese government envision a role for the G7 to, uh, to intervene with any economic leverage to deter or, or mitigate the risk of escalation in such a crisis? Um, Secretary Raimondo, uh, you've met, spoken before about the Russian military being forced to strip semiconductors from uh, kitchen appliances in Ukraine. 
do you have any sense of whether those uh, those uh, supply constraints that they have are imposing a time limit on their military operations there? And more generally, do you see that being applicable um, in a in a with respect to China in a in a crisis, um, or even on the other foot, uh, does the U.S. have sufficient semiconductor supplies to see to see see through a Taiwan crisis in the near term? And then Secretary Blinken, um, the the USS Ronald Reagan carrier strike group is in the South China Sea, but there's been a lot of ink spilt on the vulnerability of the surface fleet if there were a crisis with China. Uh, are you having any conversations about near-term uh, pre-positioning of defense assets, and you know, with Japan or other allies in the region next week? Thank you. Thank you for your question. Regarding uh, the visit by Speaker Pelosi, uh, as a, uh, we are not in a position as a Japanese government to comment on that. Now, uh, going on to uh, between Japan and the U.S., uh, in May, uh, in a summit at the Joint Declaration regarding Taiwan, uh, base, basic approach to Taiwan has not been changed. It's, um, Taiwan Strait, uh, peace and uh, uh, prosperity is important, remains the same. And uh, a peaceful resolution of the Strait issue uh, has been agreed upon uh, between the leaders. Uh, thank you. With respect to the export controls, we have reason to believe that with each passing week and month, the export controls have an even more devastating effect on Russia's ability to continue this war. Uh, as the stockpile, they develop the stockpile in preparation for the war for this, these sorts of technology and spare parts. As that continues to dwindle, uh, their ability to continue to operate uh, is, is uh, reduced significantly. Uh, I will say the, re the reason that these export controls are having such an effect is because we're doing them in coordination with our allies, um, first among them the Japanese. I mean, this isn't the United States acting alone. We have a coalition of 36 countries. Japan stepped up immediately. And together, we are uh, denying Russia parts, including semiconductors, and importantly, as we discussed today, collaborating on enforcement. And, and we will continue to collaborate on enforcement to continue to deny Russia what it needs to continue this war. With respect to the United States, I have no concern that we have an ability to um, meet our needs. And furthermore, the fact that Congress a acted yesterday on the CHIPS Act is an enormous step forward to ensure that um, we'll be able to protect ourselves and our allies and have adequate semiconductor supplies um, for, for decades to come. And with regard to any contingencies and any preparations made uh, on, uh, on a military level, I defer to the Pentagon. Well, I have a question to uh, both uh, Minister Hagida and the Secretary Raimondo. Well, economically, competition can take place and it might develop into a trade friction. It had happened in the past. But uh, what do you think about the alliance relationship covering the economic area? And uh, what are you thinking about further strengthening the semiconductor supply chain? What will be the future state of cooperation between Japan and U.S., particularly in the semiconductor? And also, do you have a plan to widen the framework between the Japan and the United States? Thank you for your question. Well, when you talk about the competition, uh, it should be based on the free and fair rules. Then it can drive economic growth and can be a source of vitality. We are the world's number one and number three economic power. Japan and U.S. will work closely, encouraging each other and enhance competitiveness and growth together. On the other hand, problems have come up 
経済秩序自体を脅かしかねないということなんです例えばサプライチェーンの上の優位性を自らの影響力行使のために利用するようなことは認められません国際ルールに反する経済的な威圧も容認はできませんこうした課題に対してはまさに自由や民主主義、基本的人権、法の支配といった普遍的価値を共有する日米が協力してルールに基づく経済秩序を守らなければならないと思っていますしっかりと競争ができるレベルプレイビングフィールドを作っていくことで地域の平和と繁栄の基盤を作ることは日米両国の大きな責任だと思います将来の産業競争力を左右する次世代半導体技術の開発は日米協力の最重要分野でありまして協力のさらなる加速に向けて5月の首脳会談で合意をした次世代半導体研究開発のためのジョイントタスクフォースを早速、先月開催をいたしました。レモンド商務長官との間で合意した半導体協力基本原則に基づき、志を同じくするパートナーと協力拡大の重要性を再確認した上で、2020年代の次世代半導体の実現に向けた研究開発、人材育成、サプライチェーンの強靭化などの協力を具体化していくことで合意をしました。我が国としては、この共同研究実施を見据え、先ほども申し上げましたが、酸素圏や利権、東大などとですね、次世代半導体研究における国内の英知を結集して、新しい研究開発組織を立ち上げることを決定しました。海外の企業や研究機関にもオープンにしてまいりたいと思いますので、日米協力をはじめ、有志国地域も含めて、国際協力研究を運ぶとしていきたいと思いますし、まさにこの会談の前にですね、レモンド省庁官の努力によって、米国側の半導体の新たな法律ができました。ここにも日本政府としても、日本企業としてもコミットしていく道をですね、早速検討してみたいと思います。Further commitment can be made on both the public and private yeah. side. Thank you. I agree. That was extremely well said by my colleague. I concur with everything he said. I would simply underscore two points. One, uh, in the Indo Pacific Economic Framework, which we have launched and, uh, with Japan and a dozen other economies in the Indo Pacific, there is a pillar focused on supply chains. And we expect that a core piece of work in the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework in supply chains will be focused on semiconductors, aligning research and development, coordinating on export controls, uh, working together. Secondly, uh, after the passage of the CHIPS Act, our goal now, the Department of Commerce will be implementing the CHIPS Act with a goal of rebuilding the entire semiconductor supply chain in America. And we welcome uh, Japanese foreign direct investment into the United States uh, as we develop that supply chain, specifically in the areas of chemicals and substrates, materials. Uh, the Japanese are world leaders. Uh, tooling, and we look forward to, uh, and as the minister said, research and development in emerging technology. It's impossible to overstate the significance of Congress's action yesterday and the opportunity for collaboration that that um, opens for the United States and Japan to strengthen the semiconductor supply chain. That concludes the press conference. Thank you, Your Excellencies. Thank you, everyone.